morning, everybody, again, and welcome to the Fervent Church. I uh, hope you guys are having a good uh, week, and hopefully you have a great Sunday, and this is just the start of it. So um, I uh, apologize, technical difficulties are on the rise today, but hey, we're, we're rolling through it, and um, you know, every obstacle is just an opportunity to praise God in a new way and just kind of fight through it. So it was beautiful, even though our, our sound wasn't working at first. I loved hearing your guys' voices. You guys are filling this room with praise, and so that was beautiful. And so we just got to roll with it. And so whatever happens is going to happen. Online audience, I just want to apologize. You're probably on a real rocky roller coaster today. <laughs> um, but tune back in tonight. Um, 8.30 p.m. Central Time, we'll have a rebroadcast of the live stream. So a um, couple announcements. First off, if you have your church bulletin, we kind of rolled this out last week. And so it is a new um, thing we're going to do every week. So it's not a new app, Version Bible app. Many of you guys have heard it of it, just maybe even called the Bible app, right? How many of you have it or, or you've heard of it, right? So download that if you haven't yet. And then you go to the bottom right-hand corner, there's a little thing that says more with three little lines. You'll click on that. There'll be a bunch of options. I think it's like number six or seven down. It'll say events. If you click on events, um, at the bottom of that map, there'll be a little tab that says Fervent Church. Um, and you can click on it. And then right now, because our service is actually live, you can save that too. So if you want to look at it later tonight or tomorrow, and you're just like, hey, what was that announcement? What was that information? You can go there and you can have it. But I will let you know that if you do not save it well, church service is rolling. Um, after church is over, it'd basically be like, you know, like if we had paper bulletins and you didn't come to church, like you're just not going to have a bulletin. So, and there's not much we can do about it. It's a free app. We're using it. To see how it works. I like it and I hope you guys would too. And so this week I've actually populated it with all of the scripture. Maybe don't look too far ahead because uh, we'll see how this goes every week. I'm like, hey, we're going to finish Genesis today. And uh, no, not really finish Genesis, but you know. So get that app there, and if you want to follow along with me, a few things there. Number one was the welcome there. Just, uh, again, we're happy that you guys are here. Those of you tuning in online, if this thing's still running, we're glad that you're here. Is it up, we think? Um, and if you're on the chat right now, throw a little thumbs up emoji so we can just see if this thing is working. Uh, we really hope so. But we really, we hope to be more than just a church to attend. You guys might be here visiting on Sunday or tuning in just visiting, but not just a church to attend, to check off the box on Sunday, but a family to be a part of. We really believe Jesus doesn't save us just so that we can go to church on Sundays, but to be a part of something different. And he wants us to be his disciples. And the, Jesus says that the world will know we're his disciples when the world sees the love we have for one another. So we really want to be more than just a church to attend, but a family to be a part of. And if you guys have been a part of this church for any amount of time, you, I hope you see and feel that, man, like this is, it's different. Um, I don't know, for me anyways. Um, other announcements moving on down, live stream. If you guys ever miss a service here, you can follow us on Facebook. Um, right now we're broadcasting on Facebook, as well as our new platform, which is the fervent.online.church. I know it's a, a whole mouthful there, um, but you can follow the link right there in the church bulletin. And so even if you're like out of state somewhere visiting, you can get our church bulletin. It'll still be live and you can join us live stream that way. And then I would just encourage you guys share it out. If you have Facebook today, like right now in your seat, just share the feed out. Just say, hey, join us for church. Um, maybe a quick little disclaimer. Technical difficulties, join us for church, um, come praise Jesus with us. But get the word out there. Really, there's nothing like just getting the word out, right? Like when someone invites you to something, it's different than just seeing an advertisement. So um, get the word out there, live stream up every Sunday, and we're going to start rolling out kind of a rebroadcast. It will be a live they call it simulated live. That's like the technical words. I'm probably not supposed to tell you that that's the word, right? Um, simulated live and it's literally a broadcast and if you watch anyone like online um, that you that's like a famous person odds are you're watching a pre-recorded service but it has live people in the chat there to pray with you to encourage you and so we're going to be rolling that out um, and I'm kind of testing so if you want to join me pop in tonight 8 30 say hey what's up and I'll say something um, as the fervent church um, you'll it's exciting it's fun we'll see what happens but Next announcement, I really don't want to spend time on announcements like I did last week, but a youth recap. We launched a youth group on Thursday. Give it up for the Lord. Come on. And we had two people come, and it was amazing. Joel was one of them. All right? This is, but no, I'm serious. Like, you guys are like, oh, two people. But 
Seriously, like we're starting from scratch. And for me, it's like it, it reminds me when we started this church. We started from scratch. People are like, you can go out to Texas. Who do you know in Texas? Well, I'm not really anybody. Like, why, why go there? I don't know. The Lord's calling us. And we're just going to go out in faithfulness so that people might know Jesus. And so that's what our church is about. That's what our youth group is about. We went to the FCA on Wednesday. Um, I, I kind of stopped in and checked it out. But what did the lady say? 360-something kids were there. Um, so we were handing out swag. Um, we have some of it in the trailer if you guys maybe want to take a peek at it or give some to your youth. But some sunglasses, a lanyard, um, things of that nature. And, there, and we got to make connections. We got connect cards there. And so I'm excited to see what will happen. We meet every Thursday at Lamp Post Coffee. It's right there in downtown Hutto, so a pretty sweet location there. And so if you know some youth or you know parents who have youth, uh, just spread the word again. Like no one's going to know about this stuff if we don't tell them that it's even an option on the table. And so I'd encourage you guys to spread the word there. Joel, tell everybody at school, man, blast. Yo, it's going down. Thursdays. Lamp post coffee. Don't even tell them there's church. Just say, come to get some coffee with me. All right. Um, and then we'll surprise attack. And so um, other ones that we got, uh, small groups. Uh, this week, guys, uh, we're meeting in my house, 6.30 p.m. there. Dinner is at 6.30. Study starts at 7. Um, go through week three and week four. Week three, you should already have done. Um, guys who are there, you know what I'm talking about, right? But um, week three and week four is what I hope that we can discuss this week. Um, if you're not plugged into small groups, it's a place, it's a community to grow with, um, growing relationally with the Lord. We're going through... Um, the Sermon on the Mount, which is just an amazing sermon, maybe the, the best one ever, right, that we have recorded for us from Jesus himself. And so we're going through it piece by piece, really good. But then we're also growing relationally with one another. So if you're looking to get plugged in, to make some friends, some people who also believe in Jesus and they want to seek Jesus and his will for their life, get plugged into this. It's a place to grow and, and it's fun. And um, it's fun, it's real, it's raw, it's all the things. And so it's like, I don't know. I love it. You guys love small groups if you're part of it? Yes. All right. Good. So I'm not the only one. Um, other ones, Fervent YouTube. If you use YouTube, go subscribe. We're putting out content there. Um, the information's in the bulletin. I'm not going to go through all of that. Fervent Instagram, it's a tool you can use to help get the word out. If you have Instagram, you believe in what we're doing, I just encourage you guys share it, spread it. Again, nothing like organically sharing it and inviting the people that you know and love. Say, hey, come check out this church that I found and come hear the word, come hear the worship, be a part of it, grow with us. Um, tools we can use and then uh, last couple things serve with us if you guys want to serve fill out a serve form on our website our website fervent.church and then you fill out the whole form there let us know what you'd like to get plugged into specifically kids ministries one that we're looking to um to kind of what do you call it staff up um, not that it's staff position build up there we go um so trying to build up uh, the roster of volunteers um, also the kids too that'd be great but if there's more kids man like we got to get ready <laughs> I'm just gonna let you know man like one day it's gonna be like overflow there and I'm just gonna say you know what just bring them in and so you got we're you, I'm just, just saying okay so yeah like all right we don't have anyone to serve your kids so watch your own kid and um, uh, so that's one area. There is a background check required for that, so just be prepared. But then other areas, if you're like a web genius, I don't know what the word would be, but like, you know, um, website stuff, you know, Google stuff, and even post-production like audio video, if you have experience with it, uh, get in contact with me. If you would like to serve um, just stuff in like editing our videos, our live stream, our website, things like that to get it more optimized, I don't know, but uh, we'd love to get you there. Um, plugged in there and um, last announcement if you'd like to give and support our, our ministry what we're doing here what we're pursuing fervent.church slash give you can give your offerings and ties there uh, it's safe secure it's also tax deductible so that's cool and then if you want to go old school put a check in the box or whatever we have our um, agape box or tithing offering box the little black one over there, you can do that. We don't pass an offering plate here, so if you're waiting for that moment, it's not going to happen. It's really like, hey, if the Lord stirs you up, it's like just go make your offering unto the Lord um, when you see fit on the way out, way in, whatever the case may be. With that said, let's pray. Bible's open, Genesis 8. See, that wasn't as long as last week. Last week, man, I was pumped about announcements. <laughs> um, 
Genesis chapter 8 is where we will be. Bible's open. Let's pray and we'll get this. So, Father, we again, we're thankful that we can be here. Lord, we thank you for all that we've been through this week. Maybe some of us harder seasons, some of us more exciting and encouraging seasons. But, Lord, you've got us here today. You've shown yourself faithful even though sometimes we are faithless, Lord, and you have shown yourself good and merciful and gracious, Lord, even though we are undeserving of it. So, God, we pray today, God, just show us more of you. We come here to know you, to worship you, and to live for you, God. So have your way here at the Fervent Church and every church across the globe and every church in Hutto, Lord. I pray that, that we would just spread the gospel with joy. People would hear that they would believe, Lord, and we just pray that you use this time in Jesus' name. Amen. So Genesis chapter 8, verse 20, I'm kind of going backwards. I will let you know that we are not going to put the verses on the screen today. We're going to blast through like a lot of, of verses. It is in the church bulletin if you want to follow along that way or open up your Bible. Nothing beats just having God's word right here, real, tangible. You can read it. You can smell it. Uh, it's, it's good, and I love to highlight my Bible. I don't know about you guys, but um, one of my friends posted a thing, like a whole little highlight. Um, what are those things called? Like a map, like, oh, yellow means promises of God, and blue means this. I'm like, I would have loved to have that 10 years ago. I'm like, I literally just grab any pen and circle, highlight. It's like, there is no rhyme or reason. I'm just like, that's really good. <laughs> but I think you should, should uh, highlight it just... It's fun. It's good. God's word is good. So uh, Genesis chapter 8, verse 20, we open up. It says, then Noah built an altar. And so he hit this a little bit, but to build up the scene again. Remember, Noah was in an ark for about a year, right? It It rained for 40 days. It flooded for 40 days. And what God was doing in that moment, right, he was actually cleansing the world of sin, He says that everyone's only evil continually. It broke God's heart. He even said in there that it it he regretted making man. Isn't that a pretty intense statement? And now it's not that God was like, oh, I didn't know they were going to do it, but man, it broke God's heart to the point that man, let's just we're going to start over with the clean slate. Tells Noah build an ark. Noah builds an ark, right? And as much as we can tell, it has never it never rained before this, right? And we'll get more into this later today. But it never rained before this moment. And then all of a sudden the rains come, the floods come, it sweeps people away. Forty days, this flood, if you remember last week, I was telling you some of the stats, or maybe it was the week before, I don't know. We've been talking about Noah for so long, I I lose track. But, um, But it literally covered the highest mountain about 25 feet underwater. Like we're talking worldwide catastrophic flood. Now, some people be like, oh, no, it was a local flood. I don't believe that, and I think there's strong biblical evidence as well as scientific evidence that there was a worldwide flood that happened there. And so that happens. Noah's in the ark. He's in there. He's waiting patiently. And then one day, as we saw last week, about a year later, the door opens. Like, hey, the season has changed, Noah. Now, you're, now I'm letting you out to pursue life and godliness and the things I have for you. And the first thing he does in verse 20 again, is that he builds an altar. He doesn't go like, oh, we need to rebuild everything. Because just imagine, you get out of the ark, everything's destroyed. There is nothing. There's no market to go to. There's no house to go home to. There's no, oh, well, my house is gone. Let me go to my family member's house, stay with them. There's nothing. So you would have to rebuild. But I love that Noah makes it a point to make an altar to the Lord. What he does there is he worships God. As when God opens the door in your life to something new, a new season, whatever it is, make it a point to worship God, build an altar. And what I love about this is verse 21 is that it says, and when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, because Noah's making a sacrifice on an altar, he's giving up these animals. When he smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth, neither will I ever Again, strike down every living creature as I have done. It says, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. And what we see here is Noah makes an altar. He worships God intentionally. And what does God do? He sees it. He receives it. I think he will do the same in our lives. When we make it a point and we make it intentional to actually praise God, build an altar so to speak, and we worship Him. When we come here on Sunday, again, I kind of like that the sound was all messed up because I got to hear you guys worship. I'm like, okay, I'm not the only one. 
Right? It's like it's good to come together and we worship God, and you need to know this, that he hears you. He sees you. And what he does is when we're worshiping from a pure heart, Jesus says to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. When we're worshiping in spirit and in truth, God receives it. The Father receives it, and he's pleased with it. And so an encouragement there would be praise him. And what we see is that it results in a covenant with, between God and man. And we'll get more into that in a second. Verse 1 of chapter 9. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And I want to pause here. I, I kind of scratched the surface last week, but I love here that the plan hadn't changed of God. Right? It's like he flooded the earth, he wiped humanity away, and Noah and his family are the only ones left here. It's a new season, everything needs to be rebuilt, um, but God is still good. Noah's worshiping God. He makes a covenant, uh, God makes a covenant with Noah, and I love that God's like, all right, be fruitful and multiply. What does that mean? It means the plan hasn't changed. It goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. What did he tell them? Be fruitful and multiply. All right, be fruitful and multiply. The plan hasn't changed. And I would say this is that the plan hasn't changed today either. All right, and I'm not saying, and let me unpack it. There's the one side of it where, yes, be fruitful and multiply, have kids and all that stuff. And I believe that's part of it. But be fruitful and multiply in your life because God expects you to be fruitful. And I can prove it from Scripture. If you go to uh, Matthew chapter 7, it's in the Sermon on the Mount, right? Jesus says that, hey, a good tree bears good fruit, and a bad tree bears bad fruit. But they're bearing fruit. And so God has made us in a way where he expects fruit, and he expects good fruit. He hopes for good fruit. But here's the, the thing, is that we are going to bear fruit one way or another. And I love that he says, be fruitful and multiply. And you might think, well, what am I going to be fruitful and multiply? Yes, kids is one way, but there's so much more that God wants to do, and he wants to, you to be fruitful in your ministry. Now, some of you are looking at me or thinking right now, Nick, I don't have a ministry I'm not a pastor at a church, but let me encourage you. Let me tell you, you have a ministry. Are you a father? Your ministry to your kids. Are you a mother? Your ministry is to your kids. Are you a spouse, right? Your ministry is to your spouse. Are you a co-worker? Your, your ministry is to your co-workers at work. You have a ministry. You just might not realize it yet. And then Jesus tells us to be fruitful and multiply. He says in one part where he says that he looks upon all the people, the crowds, as it says, it says, and he has compassion. And it's kind of like he's moved with sadness, and he says that all these people are like, like uh, sheep without a shepherd, like they're lost. But man, if only someone would tell them, they might find hope, they might find life, they might find purpose. And if only someone would tell them, and what does he say? He says, the fields, or what does he say? Help me. Fields are ripe, something. Harvest is plentiful, there we go. I knew it wasn't the fields. I was like, hold on. See, this is good. See, we help each other out, right? It's, uh, the harvest is plentiful, meaning, hey, it, it's, you can be fruitful if you want to. You just need to go out there. But then he says the workers, though, they're few. It's like not many people will actually step up to let God use them. But here's the thing, is, again, is that God does expect you to be fruitful. There's plenty of ministry out there. Paul tells Timothy, Paul, kind of an older pastor, telling a younger pastor, says, fulfill your ministry. He tells the church at Galatia, he says, do not grow weary in doing good, for in due season you will reap a harvest if you don't give up. And so God totally, he expects us to be fruitful. He expects us to multiply, right? And you might say, well, what does multiply mean? Well, what I think it is, is we make other leaders, Right? Someone, some pastor said once some, something of this sort, and he says that great leaders don't make great followers. They make great leaders. Great leaders make great leaders. Like we, we don't want you just to follow us. We want you to be a leader as well. Jesus is calling you into the ministry. It's not, oh, you just go preach and share and love people. It's like, no, we are in this together, and so we lead others to be leaders of others. We encourage others. We build each other up. We teach others. And so I just wanted to note that, man, it's like, yes, this is Old Testament, Noah, and we could say, oh, that was good for him. But let me tell you, it's a word for us today. Be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. It's God's heart, his desire, I really believe. Verse 2, 
The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Verse 3, every moving thing that lives shall be for food, be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. Now I want to note here is just because God has given us everything doesn't mean that we should use and abuse everything. All right, I know this is kind of a side note, but uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 23, basically says, all things are lawful, but not all things are beneficial. I have on the back of my old truck this sticker. I didn't put it there, but I love it. It says, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Right? It's like cheesy, but it's so true. We're like, oh, well, you know, God's given us everything. Right? And, and, but we need to be careful in this mindset because we think, oh, well, God's given me everything so I can do whatever I want to do. No, you can't do whatever you want to do without um, consequence. There's consequences. And I believe Paul says, man, all things are lawful. And you might be able to say, yeah, hey, it's legal in the United States, but it's not beneficial. It's not helping me be fruitful and multiply. Right? And we have to think about those things. Be wise in these last days. Just because we can doesn't mean we should. In verse 5, I love that God gives some rules here. Kind of the first law, if you will. And he says, um, verse 5, And for your lifeblood I will re- require a reckoning. From every beast I will require it, and from man for him, his fellow man I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. And you be fruitful and multiply, increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. And so again, we see there's this like sin and wickedness. He wipes the slate clean. Noah's got this fresh start. And then God gives him some rules, some laws there. He says, don't basically don't kill each other. And if you do, you will be killed. I know it's like a harsh thing, but really God's word is not here to harm us. It's not here to take anything away from us, to hinder our life. God's law, God's rules are there to show us that sin is serious. Right? To, for one, it's like a mirror. We would look into the law, right? And, and Jesus says, oh, man, you've got to fulfill the law. And you're just like, I can't. And so that's the point. You're, you fall short. Only Jesus has fulfilled that. And then we look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Right? So he gives us rules, laws, if you will, right there. Um, is the start of some of them, verse 5 through 7, and then verse 8. Here's some new territory today, right? Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark, it is for every beast of the earth. I will establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. So again, Noah built an altar at the beginning of this. The Lord received it. He saw it. He, he was worshipped, and he was pleased, and then he makes a covenant, not only with Noah, but with all mankind. Not only with all mankind, but with all the beasts of the earth, all the animals. God's making a covenant here. It, and a covenant, if you're not familiar with that word, is a promise. God is making a promise. Verse 12, And God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. So God's saying, This is the covenant forever. Okay, just understand. So this isn't just for Noah in this day. This is for you and I today and any generation that would live on until the return of Christ. For all future generations, I have set my bow in the cloud and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. Verse 17, God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh on the earth. Now let me ask you a question. For those of you who know, or maybe this is the first time reading through, what is God's sign of the covenant? A rainbow. A rainbow, and that's the sign where God would say, this is my sign. Just imagine it, right? Noah gets off the ark, right? It just rained and flooded for 40 days. He's on this ark for almost a year here, and it's like, like I would be traumatized. I don't know about you, 
Right? I've been through some things. I've never been on a boat for a year um, while everybody else on the earth was dying. Um, I'd be traumatized. And you'd come out here, and then God's like, I'm going to make a covenant with you, right? Because just imagine, if they, God didn't make this covenant, what do you think Noah's thinking the next time he sees a gray cloud in the sky? Oh, man. I don't know, man. Like, family, you, you right with God today? You know what I mean? Like, hey, hey, wife, what have you been doing back there? Are we good? Like, we don't need this to happen again. And so I would be fearful. I would be traumatized. And God says, I'm going to make a rainbow. So now envision it. The, the clouds come in. Right? It would be fearful. It would be a little scary, a little trembling, if you will. You hear the thunder. The thunder here in Texas is pretty amazing. I'm sure you guys know that, but it's not like that everywhere. The thunder rolls. Man, Garth Brooks was right in that. <laughs> Um, here in Te- I told someone that I was like, dude, it ain't like Tucson Thunder. It here it just goes on. I don't know. This is where Garth Brooks was when he wrote that song. But you imagine it, it's coming in. I'd be a little terrified. But then God says, I'm going to make this promise with you. And then you know, you maybe you don't know, but like just science wise, like a rainbow, it, it appears because of the water in the air, right? So then the r- rain clouds come in. Maybe right before it starts raining, you see a rainbow, and it's God saying, Yeah, I know you're you're scared, Noah. But don't worry, here's my sign. I'm not going to flood the earth because of man's wickedness and evilness and sinful desires. I remember, or maybe right after the, the rain, right? It's like it rains just enough where Noah's a little scared, and then the rainbow appears, and it's like, oh, it's over, and God remembers. right? He remembers us, and so that's the sign of God's covenant, not only to Noah, but to you and I today. Now, today, we're just like, oh, well, look, a beautiful rainbow. For Noah, it was like this just boost of like, oh, man, we're not going to die today. We can live to see another day. God isn't going to do it again. I'm, and that would be comforting. But today, in our world, was the rainbow became a sign of wickedness. It's become a sign of sin, right? The world has taken God's sign of his covenant to us. It's, it's a gift to us. And the world has literally taken it, twisted it, and they basically make it a, a metaphorical middle finger to God, saying, we, we don't care about this. You guys know what I'm talking about. The LGBTQ, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer community would take that and they use that there, and then you see it on places, right? Oh, this is a safe place. It's not a safe place from God's uh, thing as it would be. It would be a sign in Noah's day, that, hey, this rainbow, it's a safe place. God's not going to kill us again because of our sin. Today, safe place. You can come here with your sin, and it's okay. You see what the world has done? They've twisted it. They've thrown it upside down, and they're just throwing it back at God. But what I love about this, I love about our God, That even though we're wicked and sinful, what God said on that day, He said, I'm not going to ever flood the earth again. Because I'm like, God, why don't you just wipe it clean again? Because God made a promise. And God is a promise-keeping God. And even though we're wicked and sinful and evil, and the world is wicked and sinful and evil, we see see it and we're like, man, it's got to be more wicked than the days of Noah. Why don't you do that again, God? And I think God would tell us today, because I made a promise. I'm not going to flood the earth again. I'm not going to wipe it out like that. And he's holding out hope. He's being patient. The Bible says he's not quick to anger. He's slow to anger. He's patient, not wanting anyone to, to uh, perish, but all to have everlasting life in him. And so we, we see the world, man, and it gets us upset, right? But I just want to encourage us. is like God is keeping his promise to you and I, but also to those who would use his sign of the covenant in a non-covenantal way but i love that the rainbow again it's a sign of his covenant where he says no i'm not going to do that i love you too much i'm going to care for you um and so we'll move on though i want to cover some more but something good to think about but verse 18 the sons of noah who went forth from the ark were shem ham and japheth Ham was the father of Canaan. Now, I think that's interesting that in the Bible right there, you see it's in parentheses. Ham was the father of Canaan because that's important, right? It's like Ham is a little bit different. It's the Bible highlighting itself for you. Like, hey, check this out. Hey, look a little more into Ham. It's not just the same. They're all three brothers. Look a little more into Ham, which we will in a moment. It says, these three were the sons of Noah. And from these, the people of the whole earth were dispersed. Right? And I know that's a big statement, right? But Really, from these three, all the tribes and nations come from. 
And you, you probably like, no, that's not possible. All right, but there's actually this dude, I wish I wrote his name down. I read some of his stuff, and he says that, that in Genesis 10, which we'll kind of briefly go over today, is that it's actually the most, it's the, not only the most, it's the only document they have to, um, to prove out like where nations came from and where people came from. And he says that it's correct. And he's not a believer. He's not a, uh, a Christian theologian pastor. He's a guy who just studies archaeology, studies um, ancient history. And he says that this is the most solid document that we have. Nothing comes close to it. It's pretty encouraging, right? If you're looking for some, some reason to believe the Bible today, if you feel like, well, I don't know if it's real. It's real. People look to it. They don't even believe in God. And they say, this is the best we got as far as, uh, as a document of where people came from, how they were dispersed. And again, we'll look at it in chapter 10, but just right there in verse nine, or 19 of chapter 9. These were the three sons of Noah. From them, the people of the whole earth were dispersed. Verse 20, now Noah began to be a man of the soil. And I think there's not much else he could do. Right? Everything's destroyed. you got to build, and the only way you're going to build is if you get your hands dirty. And everything's going to come from the earth there. And it says, he planted a vineyard. He planted a vineyard, so he's kind of, I mean, again, there's not much else to do. He's got to work, but he's kind of going back to his roots. Adam was a bit of a gardener. God gave him the garden, says, hey, tend it and keep it. He gave him a job, and Noah's kind of going back to that. And he planted a vineyard, verse 20, uh, 21. He drank of the wine and become became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. Now, if you, let's just unpack it for a minute. He drank the wine, so he planted a vineyard. Nothing wrong with planting a vineyard. Some grapes, grapes are good. Planted a vineyard, though, he made wine. Some people would argue, oh, well, you know, it wasn't the same as it was before the flood, blah, blah, blah. That doesn't matter, right? It's like he, he drank the wine, he became drunk, and he's passed out naked in a tent. Right, it's like for those who are like, oh, what's the, how's the Bible relevant? It's like, man, that's, some people might tune in, in today. Like, that was me last night. I don't know. But this word is for you. It's like the Bible is real. The Bible is for us. And then I love that Noah is not an innocent man. We think, well, why does Noah get this free pass out of, uh, out of wrath and destruction? What, what's so good about him? Well, the Bible says that God's psalm is righteous. But you need to know just because God's psalm is righteous doesn't mean he was perfect. And so maybe you're waiting today like, hey, I just need to get my life more perfect in order before I can serve God. God's not looking for you to get your life in order before you serve God. He's looking for you to come to him today as you are, and he will start cleaning your life up. He will start guiding you. He'll fix you up, man. He'll reveal things. And just know this, it's never over. Right? Okay, you conquer some things. You conquer getting drunk. I don't get drunk anymore. Hey, praise God. But let me tell you, God's not done with you yet. All right, he's still working on you. He, he's never done until, man, until we go to see him one day. So Noah's drunk, passed out naked in his tent. And I think there's a few things I want to hit here is that, number one, drinking, right? Drinking is one of those things we would call a gray area. You guys know what a gray area is? It's not black or white. We can't go to a Bible verse and say, see, he said that having a drink is sin and you're going to hell. The Bible doesn't say that. So I'll encourage those of you who maybe feel uh, convicted in that. But then I also want to say the Bible also doesn't say, hey, go ahead and drink freely and have as much as you want. So it's a gray area. Other gray, there's tons of gray areas in the Bible. But the thing about gray areas is it is a slippery slope, and you need to know that. God has given us freedom. We can operate in freedom. We can enjoy the things he's given us. But there is a point where we got to say, okay, enough's enough. I have to have a limit, right? Because if anything, drinking-wise, and maybe this is, I shouldn't say this, but I'm just going to be real. Anything from the Bible, it almost says, like, drinking's totally fine. Having a drink, that is. Right? Jesus made barrels of wine, right? He took, he took barrels of water, made it into barrels of wine, at a wedding, right? If you're at that wedding, you've been like, "Woo, this is awesome!" And even the the dude, like the groom's, like, "What is this wine? Why have you saved this till the end? This is the best wine I've ever tasted." Which tells us, like, man, Jesus doesn't mess around. It's the it's the good stuff. But then we see also Jesus when he's given Passover, he says, "Take this in remembrance of me. This is the blood that's spilled out in the new covenant." And he gives them the wine. Do this in remembrance of me. We know Paul writes to Timothy. He says, "Put a little wine in your water." Because it's going to be good for your stomach. It's almost like a, a medicine of that day and age. 
And so anything from the Bible would be like, oh, well, you know, it doesn't seem so bad, but you need to know that it is a slippery slope. It is dangerous territory. And if you don't have self-control, which God gives you, one of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. If you don't have self-control, don't even mess with it. I would say don't mess with it at all if you can, if you can do that, right? Because the Bible does make it clear that getting drunk is a sin. Well, having a, a glass of wine, maybe not a sin, but you know, you end up, you go too far. And what happens too? We go too far, we get drunk, and oftentimes that leads to more sin, right? You make stupid decisions, and then in the morning you wake up, you regret it. You don't just regret getting drunk, but you regret all the things you did while you were drunk. It just leads to more sin, and that's what a gray area does. When we, we express liberty in a gray area, and we go down that slippery slope, it doesn't just stop there, it spreads. You need to know that sin spreads. And so drinking, again, maybe we can't say today that, that the Bible says not to have it, although Psalm 31, or Proverbs 31 says, Oh, Lemuel, which is a king. Oh, King Lemuel, he says drinking is not for kings, right? He's basically like, you don't need to be doing this stuff. And so there is that, but I would say this, getting drunk is a clear sin because Paul writes, he says, don't be drunk in, don't, don't be drunk in wine, what he says, and then there's a smart aleck people, maybe some of you here today, oh, well, he didn't say whiskey or vodka. Let's just not be stupid, okay? <laughs> like, let's not play that game with God. He says, don't be drunk with wine. Just don't be drunk with alcohol. And then the thing he says is be filled with the Holy Spirit. And there's that comparison he makes. You ever seen a liquor store, right? Some of you, maybe you've gone into it. What do they call liquor? Spirits. Isn't it weird? Do you ever put these two together? It's like, hey, oh, I'm going to go here, and then you, you drink this. You drink it, you get drunk, and you almost feel empowered. You ever heard it called liquid courage? Right? I, was, um, I was not always a um, Christian man, okay? So there's days where it's like you have this liquid courage, man. Oh, we can do anything, and you feel like you're, you're filled with the Spirit. And if anyone listening to this who can't see me, it's quotation marks, okay? Like filled Filled with the Spirit, you feel like it, but it's a fake imitation. It's Satan's attempt to try and make you feel like you got something. But then Paul says, don't be filled with the spirits of the world. Don't be drunk on wine. Don't be drunk, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, the real deal. So again, gray areas are a slippery slope. We see Noah here. He plants a vineyard. Nothing wrong with that. He even has a drink from his vineyard. I would say nothing wrong with that, but it went overboard. And what we're going to see is that, again, sin doesn't just stop where you left it. Sin spreads. You've planted the seed there, and it will infect everything and everyone around you. And then verse 22, so Noah's drunk in his tent, passed out, naked. right? Verse 22, and Ham, which is Noah's son, who is the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Now, this is a super interesting verse. There's basically three ways to go about this as far as interpretation. Some of you who are familiar with it, you'll know. But oftentimes they say, okay, Ham saw the nakedness of his father. Something happened because you keep reading on. Noah wakes up. He's, he knows what happened, and he curses not only Ham, but his grandson Canaan. So you could tell, like, hey, something big happened here. So number one, one thought of this is that, well, Ham had homosexual relations with his father or something of that sort. He sees his father naked there, and he, he sins because he's already sinning. He's um, passed out, and so people think that might have happened. I think it's a possibility. I don't think it's likely because we don't really have scriptural evidence to support that. There's another view there that would be that Ham slept with Noah's uh, mom, or wife, so his mom. Right? Noah's passed out. He's in his tent. His wife's probably there with him, right? And so then he sees the nakedness of Noah, probably his wife as well, which would be Ham's mom. And then that Ham um, kind of took things in his own hands, took advantage of the situation there, um, and maybe that happened. Now, I think those are possibilities, but I think if we just stick with this text too, is that, the, that Ham saw the nakedness of his father, and he tells his two brothers. Let's just leave it at that. Let's not even try and dive deeper and dissect it. He sees his father's passed out naked in the tent, and he's like, hey, Shem, Japheth, come check out Dad. He's really drunk. He's naked in his tent. I'm serious. Come look. 
Check it out. Right? Like, and, and you just think of that. What is he doing? Well, he's disgracing Noah. He, he's putting him down. He's basically like almost trying to make himself the new righteous Noah, maybe in a sense there. And he's putting Noah down, right? And he's trying to get his brothers to tag in. You ever had someone like that? Or if you have little kids, like you, you, they get all their friends, go, oh, come look at this, right? It's like something happens. I remember when I was in kindergarten. This is one of the only things I remember. We're on a rug, right? We're sitting down, crisscross, applesauce, and um, the teacher's talking. And anyways, my friend, uh, he hands me a crayon. And he's like, yeah, color on the carpet. It's cool. <laughs> And uh, anyways, and then I do it, right? And I'm, I'm crisscross applesauce coloring between my, my legs there. The teacher can't know. She's never going to know. It's going to be fine, right? What do we know? We're getting up for recess. Nick, you're staying here. I'm like, what? Why? She's like, you're going to scrub the crayon out of the carpet. Like, I was like, how did you know? Um, but it's like things like that where it's like sin will spread like that where it's like, hey, come, come check this out. I know for me, my BC days, before Christ, right, it's like when I... Um, First time I ever smoked marijuana. I wasn't in planning on it, but it was one of my friends who said, hey man, we're today after school, we're gonna, I'm gonna get high. It was his first time too. And, I, and if you would ask me five minutes before that, hey, will you ever smoke weed in your life? I'd say, no, absolutely not. It's for crazy people. Um, <laughs> like, no, I wouldn't do it. But then he asks, or he says that, hey, if you wanna come along, you can come along. So all day throughout school, I'm thinking, man, is he really gonna do it? There's no way he's gonna do it. Um, is this really going down? And then they're like, hey, after school, like, hey, you want to come over? We're going to smoke weed, remember? I know this is weird if you're new to here at this church, but um, there's a point to it. But, you know, and you want to come over? And I'm like, okay, I'm going to go over because I just want to see what's going to go on. I just want to see what's going to happen. I don't know that I'm going to do that. But then I'm there, right? You're caught off guard. I've already invested this much. I want to come see the sin. I want to come see you actually smoke marijuana. Next thing you know, they pass it to me. And then... Peer pressure hit, takes hold of me, and I tried it. Didn't think I'd ever do it. Never thought I would do it. And then that moment happened, and it happened there. And then I think, in a, in a way, Ham's like that. Come check this out. Like, he stumbled upon his dad. Whatever might have happened, maybe something did happen uh, homosexually or with his mother there. But then he's like, hey, come check it out now. See what I did. Come, come check out this. He's disgracing him, and he's trying to spread the sin and so something big had happened here. And then um, a couple things to note is that, number one, whatever did happen, Noah's drunken state allowed it. Had Noah not been drunk, this probably wouldn't have happened. And so just something to note there. It's like we were like, man, Ham's messed up and he's got some problems. Um, I'd say it starts with uh, Ham's dad, the father, Right? Uh, he wasn't there to father his child, to teach him what he should or shouldn't do, to protect him from going into sin because Noah, again, was drunk. He was there, but he wasn't there. And maybe some of you, you know what that's like. You might have a dad at home, but he was never there, present in your life to help you, to protect you. And for fathers, we're supposed to help protect our family, teach them the way that they should go. And um, verse 23 Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward and they did not see their father's nakedness. So you see the pictures again. Ham's like, hey guys, check it out. What, whatever had happened in that tent, the sin that went on, he's trying to get his brothers in on it. But what did the brothers come do? They come cover him up. Right? And they're not covering it up like, hey, let's just not talk about this. we got issues. Don't let anybody know about it kind of thing. It's like, no, we're going to cover him up because we don't want him to be put to shame. We're going to cover him up because we care about him. We're going to cover him up because we love him, because he's our father. And the Bible says that love covers a multitude of sin. Right? They covered him up because they love him. They care about him. And so instead of indulging in the sin and the gossip and spreading things out there to the world, they cover him up. They protect him. They love their father in that way. And they care for him when he couldn't really care for himself. Verse 24, it says, uh, When Noah awoke, right, he wakes up from his wine. He's drunk. It says, And he knew what his youngest son had done to him. So he knew. For those of you who have ever been drunk before, you might not remember clearly the night before, but you know when something happened. 
you know when there, there's something that went on that you're, you shouldn't have done, you shouldn't have gone there, you shouldn't have been with those people. But again, sin will always take you farther than you want to go. But it says Noah woke up, he knew what his youngest son had done to him, and he said, cursed be Canaan. He doesn't just say cursed is Ham. Ham's the one who sinned, right? If you look at it just logically, he doesn't just say cursed be Ham. He says cursed be Canaan, which would be a curse to Ham. You understand? Cursed be Canaan, and I think that's, again, it kind of stresses that something happened. We don't know exactly what something happened. It was sinful for sure, and Noah cursed Canaan, his grandson. It's got to be pretty intense to, to curse your own grandson, right? The Bible says that grandkids are like, a, I don't know, some really awesome blessing that I'll figure out one day. <laughs> but um, they're, they're good, but Noah curses his grandson, one of them. He says, "Cursed be Canaan, because." All right, let's go on. Verse twenty-five. He says, uh, or that is twenty-five. He said, "Cursed be Canaan, as servant of servants shall he be to his brothers." He also said, "Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant." After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. So again, we see because of the sin, which started with Noah, right? Let's not just be like, oh, Ham, you're messed up, dude. No, Noah wasn't a father. Noah was drunk, and he passed on his responsibility there. He was off guard. Noah's sin led to his son's sin. And because of that, we see Canaan is cursed there. One man's sin can, can really corrupt all of the offspring. And I think we should understand that today, especially fathers or soon-to-be fathers or people who might be fathers one day. Man, it's like you got to understand like your, your role in your family has huge significance, especially with your kids. right? Fathers, we should be teaching them, guiding them, protecting them. But if we sin... Our kids are going to see it. And they see that we compromise in some gray areas sometimes, and then, well, then that's okay. The thing is that they don't understand what, what self-control might be. So you might have the fruit of self-control in your life from the Holy Spirit, but your, your son or daughter might not understand what that is, and they just think, oh, well, I can just have as many drinks as I want. They don't know that you only had one. But we've got to understand that we have a huge responsibility, and sin doesn't Stay with you again. Sin spreads far beyond anything we can think, and sin will far outlast us. And you need to know that. Sin's not just for today. Sin will impact eternity there, really, unless, of course, there's repentance and turning to Jesus to believe in Him. And I'll get to that in a minute, but verse 26, again, I read it. Verse 26, 27, Noah blesses the other sons, Shem and Japheth. I think here we can see something that fathers, there's something to our words over our kids. Our words have weight. Our words can guide and direct. Our words help shape and form who our kids become. All right, you might think like, well, no, it's not that important, but think about it. Just think about your life. Think about your father. And I, and I am sorry if it brings up tough feelings, but you know, or maybe it brings up really great ones. For me, it's like my dad was an awesome dad. He is an awesome dad. And he always told me, just like, you, you could do whatever you want to do. He'd always encourage me to, like, go do crazy stuff. Yeah, go to engineering class. You're so smart. And I'm like, I don't want to do math ever, Dad. <laughs> but I appreciate you believing in me, right? But, you know, he, he encouraged me. And so I think that's part of my character today where I'm a little bit of the go-getter. Like, let's just go out and do it. I think we're capable. Maybe I'm crazy, but I think we can reach the world from this little church right here and preach the gospel, right? But that's something my dad spoke into me, spoke over my life. But think about it if it was the opposite. Or maybe some of you have that father who was just absent, right? Or they're always mad at you. Oh, why do you always do this? You always mess up. And then you grow up as an adult. And maybe today you're the type who's like, oh, I'm just not good enough. I can't do it. Because your father either spoke that into your life or he didn't speak encouraging things. And Noah's speaking this stuff over his sons. He's like, cursed be Canaan. And man, he does become a curse. And there's all kinds of wickedness we'll see in chapter 10. But then he's like, blessed be Shem and Japheth. He's like he's, he's speaking over their life, and our words matter. And again, fathers, our words have weight. 
so do our actions, so take them seriously. And I, and I don't want to leave you ladies out either. So do yours, okay? Just so in case you're like, oh, where's our word? Your words matter too. Your actions matter. We need that in the, in the kid's life, in our life. And honestly, fathers, like if we didn't have our wives, man, what would we do? I don't know what we'd do. We'd be a sad mess. At least I would be. Um, verse 28, again, Noah lived 350 years after the flood. That's a long time. He was already 601 years old, I believe, when he got out of the ark. So he lives for about 349 more years. And it says all the days of Noah were 950 and he died. So I just think here for a minute, it's like the last thing we really know about Noah is that he lived another 350 years. And the only thing that the scriptures tell us is that he got drunk, he passed out in his tent, he was naked, and then he cursed Canaan, blessed his other sons, and he died. Not a very great legacy to go out on. Man, he started really good, though. You're like, wow, this guy, righteous in God's sight. God calls him, build an ark, and he's going to save the world through him, through Noah. Wow, this is amazing. But it can show you how fast things can turn. God's working in your life, doing amazing things in your life, through your life, in your family, to all of a sudden, one little sin, one little mess up, and it changes everything. And then all we see here is just, and he died. He didn't do much that we know of after that. Verse uh, 10, or chapter 10, verse 1, we're going to fly through this. We're not going to go through it super in depth. But these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Sons were born to them after the flood. And so we see this is the, uh, the generations here. And what we will see, and I hope you notice, is that really the curse continues, right? It didn't just end right there in chapter 9. Oh, curse be Canaan. And he's like, oh, whatever, Dad. You're just crazy and saying mean things because you're drunk all the time. No, it's like he actually invoked some type of curse here. And sin starts to spread even further. And so, verse 2, the sons of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tyrus. The sons of Gomer, well, let's not even go there, right? Not yet. The sons of Japheth, just a couple, I'm really just going to point out some. This is a huge study you should go spend a lot of time on, like, Google, uh, not Google, I, Google, you could Google, but who knows what you'll get if you look up. I don't trust Google's definition, right? Oh, Google Magog and figure out what that means. Google doesn't know who God is. And, uh, you know, anyway, so go look at like a biblical dictionary. Um, look these words up, the names up, and figure these things out. But one thing I want to note is J Japheth um, fathered Magog. Magog later on in Revelation, you guys know what I'm talking about here. It's like he's going to uh, uh, gather the people from the four corners of the earth. And then there's Gog and Magog, which many people believe is like this mili uh, military, political power type source. And, and one of them, or maybe even both of them, being the Antichrist. It's interesting. And it all comes back right here, right there to Japheth, the son of Noah. Um, Verse um, 3, the sons of Gomer are these guys. Verse 4, the sons of Javon um, are these people. And verse 5, from these, the coastland people spread in their lands, each with his own language by their clans in their nations. And again, this is, this is a, uh, a pretty amazing artifact as far as the Bible goes and history goes that many people, scholars, atheists alike, agree that this is an incredible, accurate document of of nations. Verse uh, 6 says the sons of Ham. Now remember, right, um, in chapter 9 when he, when he put in um, parentheses, Ham was the father of Canaan. Now we're going to see Ham here. We're going to dive a little deeper. This is where we'll spend pretty much the rest of our study here. The sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. So these are his sons, right? Those Egypt should sound familiar. Right? You guys like um, think, like, well, yeah, it's a country today. Well, it started with a person. Right? It started with a person here, Egypt, um, which is, would later become a pretty clear enemy of God. Right? They kept the Hebrew people as slaves. I mentioned that last week. Um, Egypt would become this enemy of God. So it just shows us how the curse continues. Right? Ham fathered Canaan. Um, and he fathered Egypt, who again, yeah, he became a curse. But not only, I think it's interesting that not only Canaan was cursed, but like all of Ham's sons were kind of cursed in this way. Put, I believe that would be Russia of today's 
uh, world in that region anyways. Um, and then we have Canaan, which would be the promised land, which would be Israel. And I mentioned it last week. It just blows my mind that it's like God would literally, like these are a cursed people who made a cursed land. And then God calls, we'll see in a couple of weeks, Abraham. He calls him to go to the promised land, which is this cursed land. You think like, oh, God's calling us to this great place. It's going to be amazing. No, like it's cursed. And we need to bring in the solution. We need to bring in this revival here. And so he calls them to the promised land to reverse the curse. But it's crazy how it all sets up here. And it's all cursed. Coming back to Noah, which would go back to Adam and Eve, of course, too. But uh, verse 7, the sons of Cush, which is one of Ham's sons. We got Seba, Havilah, Sabta, Ramah, and Sabteca. Uh, the sons of Ramah, Sheba, and Dedan, verse 8. Cush fathered Nimrod. He was the first on earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. And we'll pause here for a second. Again, this is something you could do a whole big study on Nimrod, what it means, who it is, um, things going on. What's interesting that I note, um, I think is worth noting, at least today, is that all the other people fathered people. Right? Noah fathered Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Um, we got Canaan who fathers um, these people. Cush fathers these other people. But Nimrod doesn't seem to father a, a person, a son. What Nimrod does is he fathers nations, which is interesting. You'll see it there. He goes on. He says, uh, Cush fathered Nimrod. He was the first on earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel. Right, Babel would become Babylon, which we know of today. Right, there's there's the great Babylon that's going to come in Revelation. But Babylon was the the kingdom that rose up right before Nehemiah's day that actually took the uh, Jewish people into exile. So they're clear enemies of God. We got Babylon, and then also what, where does he say? Um, I'm uh, Babel, Erech, Akkad. Kalna in the land of Shinar, verse 11. From that land he went into Assyria and built Nineveh. You guys remember Nineveh, right? The, the story of Jonah. Nineveh was this godless nation, and then God calls Jonah and says, Hey, I want you to go to Nineveh. And Jonah's basically like, No, I don't want to go to Nineveh, God, because they hate you, they hate me. And matter of fact, I hate them because they hate me. And I don't want to see your mercy and grace poured out upon them, so I'm getting out of here, getting on the first boat somewhere else. That's what he does. You know, he gets swallowed by a great fish, repents, comes back to the Lord, and God gives him a second chance. And then the, the message didn't ever change, too, with Jonah, right? It was the same message before he got swallowed by a fish and afterwards, go to Nineveh. Right? You'd think, well, you messed up, you blew it. What's the plan now? And God's like, same thing, go to Nineveh. He goes there, and what do you know? They all repent, and they come, uh, come to the Lord, which is an amazing thing. But Nineveh was fathered by Nimrod, right? Nimrod fathers these godless nations, these enemies of God, and I think it's interesting, and they all come from Ham's line of things, Canaan's line of things, and he and also even says Assyria. Assyria was a clear enemy of God. They're the ones who actually invaded Israel um, the first before the Babylonians uh, came in. Just some history for you, but they're clear enemies of God. That's the point there. Verse 13, Egypt fathered Ludium, Anamim, Lahabib, Naphtahim, Pathrism, and verse 14, or I said that one, uh, Kaslehim, from whom the Philistines came, which is another point of underlining. The Philistines, you know who the Philistines were? Like just any story, any reference you want to throw out there just for fun comes to mind. David and Goliath. Right? Yeah, it's like it's totally like they're clear enemies of God, and then um, they're all kind of scared there. To go against Goliath, who would be a Philistine, who many believe was some type of like Nephilim, possibly, who knows. And some people think Nimrod was as well. And Nimrod, you know, hey, he ended up fathering them. So, hey, it's possible, fathering these nations, if you will, to a degree. But the Philistines, clear enemies of God, who God would call to go against them, uh, to say, hey, rise up, we got to go. David comes, he kills Goliath. He says, I mean... Great story. We'll get to that one one day. But what we see is the curse continues. The curse spreads far beyond just being drunk in a tent, f far beyond just ham. Like, hey, guys, come check it out. Sin spreads. Sin infects. 
and it doesn't stop and it doesn't play favorites with people there. But um, verse um, 15, Canaan fathered Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, and the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Archites, the Sinites, the Arvidites, the Zemorites, and the Hamathites. Afterward, the clans of the Canaanites dispersed. And so something to note there is that um, all, all these ites, if you will, those were also people that um, they came from Canaan, right? Canaan, uh, the promised land, which became the land of Canaan. There are all these different ites, people groups, and those were the people that God would call later on the Israelites to go in and conquer these lands. Again, to me, it's just mind-blowing. Like This could have all been avoided had Noah just not got drunk in a tent. If he didn't let his son fall into sin, and if his son didn't sin, the curse wasn't invoked there. Pretty crazy, pretty wild. But sin spreads. And one... Um, I want to jump forward. You guys can read these names, the rest of them, on your own time. I'm sure you'll do much better than me, but we're going to jump to verse 32. Right, The part I'm skipping, it's the generations of Shem. It's good stuff. You should read it. But verse 32 says, These are the clans of the sons of Noah, according to their genealogies in their nations, and from these the nations spread abroad on the earth after the flood. And so in closing a little bit today is that sin, again, spreads far and wide, and it goes much further than what we think. And what we see is, again, genealogies infected with sin. It's going back to Noah, right, which would go back to Adam and Eve as well. But again, Noah had a clean slate, and he blew it by just compromising, by being an absent father, if you will. And so sin infects, and now my question for you and I, how will we live our lives? How will we live our lives? How will we live on? How will our kids remember us? How will our grandkids remember us? How will, you know, if the Lord tarries 100, 200, 300 years from now, how will we have made an influence in our kids' lives? Because nowadays, right, you're like, well, what can I do? We're already cursed. Noah's curse happened, right? But Jesus came in to reverse the curse. He is the solution, right? It says that if we come to him, 1 John 1, 1.9 says, If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us of all sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Now, in Noah's day, they might not have been able to be cleansed like this, but we have the ability to have a clean slate every day. Right? Hey, Lord, I messed up last night. Would you just renew me? Would you transform my mind, my heart? Align me with you. I want to know you more, right? It's like we have that opportunity every day. And so if you blew it yesterday, come to the Lord today. Confess your sins. Repent and believe in Him. And we can actually, we can live a life that's not like Noah's. You can live a lasting legacy, one that matters, one that impacts your kids there, right? How will you live your lives today? Will you be like Noah? Really fathering the destruction and deceitfulness of sin is what he was doing? Or will we rise up and show the world that, man, we're, we're a redeemed people. We're saved. We're forgiven. We have the resurrected life. And will we show them that you can have this too? We're, we're not special in the sense that this is only for us. No, this is for everyone. This is why we're here to tell people about the good news that you don't have to live a cursed life like that anymore. You can come find Jesus and you find life eternal. The days of Noah, closing up our whole five weeks in Noah, the end will come. The end of the world will come one day. Jesus says that in the end, the last days, it'll be like the days of Noah, that no one knows when it's going to happen, that everything seemed normal until it wasn't. The floods came, the waters uh, fell, and when Jesus comes again, it's going to be much like that. We're not going to know when it's going to happen, but are you ready? And are you building a, say Terry's again for a long time, are you building a legacy? Are you being fruitful and multiplying while we're here, um, building a legacy that doesn't look like Noah's? Like, I want my kids to know the Lord. I want them to glorify God, whatever that means. One of my sons, it might be a video game maker to the glory of God. And like, hey, I want you to glorify God. I want my kids to. I want you guys to. I want this to be, like, we can make eternal impact. Do you ever think about that? Again, it's like, 
literally, your lives. You're like, me? Yes, you. If you're listening, you can make an eternal impact in someone's life if you just show them, show them Jesus. You don't need to have it all together. You don't need to know it all, right? But I don't know enough. I'm not a Bible uh, theologian. It's like you don't need to. Just introduce them to Jesus. And Jesus will take it from there. He'll empower you. He'll give you the words you need when, you, when the time is right. But um, in closing here, I want to invite uh, David back up, get, uh, and we'll get into communion. And i got a couple verses I want to share with you. If you have the Bible app open, you can check them out. But I mentioned one already. is 1 John 1, 9. And again, I, I hope that you would be encouraged by this verse, is that God is faithful, God is just, and He is faithful to forgive us of all sin. If you find yourself today that you, man, I've gone too far. Again, I made the joke earlier, but maybe it really happened. Maybe last night you were drunk, passed out in your house. You can come to God today and you say, God, I blew it. I was doing things I shouldn't have done. And you come to the Lord today and that says he, he forgives us and he cleanses us. 1 Peter 3.18 says that Christ su- suffered once for all sins. Right? He suffered once for all sins to bring us to God. And again, he's reversing the curse in that sense where it's like you don't need to live the legacy of your father or your mother. You don't need to live the legacy of Noah. You can li- leave a legacy of, of righteousness if you come to Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, many of you know it, but it tells us that Jesus, he became our sin. He literally swapped places, right? It's like it was that bad. It's like, you know what? We can't even change this. I just need to come in. I'm going to take everything here. You can have my righteousness. He swaps places with us. He became sin so we could become his righteousness and we can have everlasting life there. The curse reversed in Jesus' name. Broken people made whole, made new. Right? Hopeless people finding hope, right? Uh, sinners being saved through Jesus, because of Jesus. And so again, our story doesn't have to end like Noah's, but we can come to Jesus and we can find our God-given purpose and story, right? And so we're going to get into communion. We're going to remember his sacrifice because it's what changed everything. So it changes so we don't have to be like Noah, Ham, or Canaan but that we can live a life unto Jesus and we can glorify him. And so I want to leave you with this verse in Luke 22, verse 14. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. I'm going to turn there. Luke 22, verse 14, Jesus having Passover with his disciples. This is right before he gets arrested, right before he goes to be crucified for our sins on the cross. It says this in verse 14, it says, And when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Which I just love because it tells us of the urgency, the, the deep felt compassion and desire of Jesus. That, hey, I know I'm about to die on the cross, but man, I really just want to be with you guys. And I think the driving factor Jesus knows is like, what I'm about to do is for you guys. And so he says, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. In verse 16, for I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup when he had given thanks. He said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. In verse 21, he says, But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. And I end with that verse because I think it's an invitation to those near and far, those near to Jesus, who love Jesus, who are close to Jesus. Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. But then he also includes Judas. He says, the one who's going to betray me is here as well. And Jesus doesn't say, I really desire to have this meal with everybody except you, Judas. No, I, I, he longs for them all. And so as we come here to the, take communion today, I want to encourage you to remember Jesus. It's not about you. Jesus died for you, 
but we're remembering him. We, we are nothing on our own. He's done it all, and so we remember him, the bread, his body, broken for us, crucified for us, the blood, the juice representing the blood poured out for us. And it's the new covenant, right? Not the covenant of, of the curse, not the covenant that we got to be fearful of God per se and that we are a sinner and we're going to be struck dead, but that we can have life through Jesus. So let's pray and we'll, we'll pass out communion. If you're new here, it's just take it as you want. Um, I'm not going to take it, say, hey, now we're going to take the bread, now we're going to take the wine, but take it as you feel led before the Lord. And then also, like if you're, if you're not a believer today, I just want to ask that you would just respectfully let the cup pass. The Bible says not to take it in an unworthy manner. And for me to care for you is just to say, hey, just let it pass. I don't want any bad uh, things coming your way because you, you took it in a wrong way. So, and if you, if you find yourself in sin today, repent first, remember Jesus, and rejoice in Jesus, all right? So, Father, thank you for this time of... of Bible study and worship, God, we pray, Lord, that you would meet us here in this time of communion, that we could remember your sacrifice. Lord, if there's any sin in us, that we would repent of it, and that we would remember that you became our sin so that we could become your righteousness, God, and we thank you for that. And so, God, I pray that you would just open our hearts and minds to think about you in this moment, to remember you, and also to rejoice in you. That our story doesn't have to end like Noah, that we sinned, we cursed, and we died, but that we sinned, we repented, we came to you, we were restored, and we found eternal life. So God, be here with us as we take communion, Lord. Thank you for your sacrifice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.